right, hello New Zealand and welcome to another episode of Turn the Page. My name is Mark Pacey from the Wired Up Archive and today we're taking you through two more chapters of Don Farmer's book. First one is nice and short, the second one is a bit longer. So we'll do that and I've uh, got another nice piece of music in between. It's not quite related but I like it so we'll play it anyway. Chapter 12, Talking Turkey. D-Day or more to the point, S-Day was drawing ever nearer as the summer holidays were petering out and the school classroom beckoned. Not a day could be wasted, so with that in mind, the boy once again roused Evan from slumber. Come on, we're going down to the creek, grab yourself some bread. With sleep still in his eyes, Evan dragged on his clothes. Out in the scullery, he opened the bread cupboard and helped himself to an extra thick crust and raided the cupboard above taking three or four homemade biscuits. These he stuffed in his khaki army jacket bought from an army surplus store. It was a tad too big for him, the cuffs covering most of his hand, all the more reason to not have to wear gloves. The boy was already kitted out, wearing a blue ex Air Force jacket that had been hanging around the house for years. No one could remember where it had come from, or who may have worn it in the past. He too was loaded down with bread crusts for breakfast. Whoops, bread crusts for breakfast on the run, no butter required. Out in the shed, they picked up the two wooden boats they had been hard at work making a few days before. Each boat was about the same length of a school ruler, crafted out of a scrap of timber. The bow of each boat was cut to a point, hopefully to let them glide through the water at a faster rate of knots. A smaller second tier of wood was nailed dead centre to the main structure and in this brazen bit or in this a brazen bit was used to drill a hole for a dowling for a smokestack. Ten minutes later they reached the creek at the bottom end of Jellicoe Street from which there they threaded oh we're not doing too good today second page and we're already making mistakes the bottom end of Jellicoe Street which from there threaded its way through Elf Mahupuku's dairy farm. Leaving the road and having climbed over the wooden farm gate, the two mapped out a course for the morning's boat races. Racing would start from where they now stood and continue on until reaching a flat-decked bridge that spanned the creek halfway in the paddock. To the boys, the paddock appeared as a huge expanse of rough grassy land with no interior fences dotted throughout with bulrushes in which rabbits took cover. It was just perfect for country kids. Sometimes when the boys were on the creek, Elf or one or two of his sons, George or John, would be seen bringing up cows from the milking. But the boys were never approached or bothered. Most of the year the creek was infested with musk and watercress, which narrowed the channel of free-flowing water. Only cleared when it got so bad, a drag line had to be brought in to pull the massive weeds from the creek. Sometimes the drag line operator was the boy's uncle, Peter McCarty, who was married to their dad's sister, Reen, and lived in a wee yellow painted cottage in Hastwell Street. When the drag line was called in, not only the creek weeds but also dozens of eels trapped in the mud were pulled out too, left to die or squirm their way back into the water. The two brothers lined their boats up for race one. Both were lowered into the water at the same instant and began their drift downstream. The rules were if your boat got caught in the watercress or musk, you could use enough force to free it, but not to help propel it along the route. Once the boats were on their way, the excitement of the race led to shouted encouragement, much like a game of two-up. As the boats rocked and rolled in the current, heading to the finishing line, the boys raced ahead to lie flat on the deck of the bridge, watching the approach. A win for one or the other, then back to the starting line for race two, three, four, and more. Tiring of that, the two boys hid their boats in the rushes and set off further afield. They had a destination in mind, which they had never attempted to reach before today. To get to where they wanted to go meant a nimble creek crossing just where the water was deepest. Head height, in fact. But there was a way of getting to the other side without getting wet. The eight-wire boundary fence on the perimeter of the Mahupuku farm crossed high above the creek to the skeet farms 
and by holding on to the fence battens, the boys could plant their boots on the second to bottom wire and, holding tightly to the top wire, edge their way over to dry land. From there they could see the skeet houses off to their left, Brian Skeet just visible driving his red farmall tractor across a paddock behind houses. His children, Maureen, Leslie, Ian and Philippa would all be mucking about somewhere as the warm glow of the sun's rays started to wash over the farms. It was an odd it was an odds on bet Mrs. Skeet would be clearing away the breakfast dishes, if their own mum's list of morning chores was anything to go by. The boy and Evan had no need to hide from the Skeets as they crossed their farms. Brian, Pat and France knew it was the farmer boys from Jellicoe Street out having fun. Boys who knew the rules, who steered clear of paddocks where a bull could be, or if calving or lambing was taking place. It was country common sense. Following the path of the creek as it wend its way towards the Waiohine River and its confluence with the mighty Ruamahanga, the two moved in parallel line to the mature pines. At nesting time, mallard ducks often chose to nest there, and they took fright and flew off. The boys would quickly count the eggs before leaving the nest undisturbed. They then headed for a patch of native trees, not thickly wooded, but a favourite haunt for a favourite haunt for rabbits and hares. Pukeko, known to the boys as bowies or bowcrackers would always be seen there close by a swamp with bulrushes. The birds squawked and flicked their white feathered rear ends, warning others of their ilk that humans were in the vicinity. Above the boys, Harry a hawk circled and white-faced herons could be seen sitting high in the branches of the trees. It was a nature lover's paradise. The boys took stock of what was there and then moved on through, heading further afield. Before long they came to the sparkling Waiohine River, only knee deep at this time of year. On the riverbank the boys took off their boots, pushing their socks into them and stringing the boots around their necks before wading into the water. From experience they knew to walk on the diagonal so to not fight against the current and slip on the slime covered stones on the riverbed. Emerging from the water they put their socks and boots back on, looking up at their final destination. The little red shed high above them on the apex of the steep grassy eastern hills. It would be a slog, especially for the younger Evan, but he was up to it. He had to be really, as he was given no quarter by the boy, who, on earlier escapades, had given him the needle for lagging behind. It was a case of go hard or go home, and Evan had come to the party. Now it was stride for stride. Walking up the gully on the easier gradient, for as far as they could, whoops, for as far as they could, the boys were eventually forced to head straight uphill. Puffing and panting, they trudged on, stopping a couple of times to take stock of the progress and to finish off their crusts of dry bread. Just as well they'd taken a few mouthfuls of river water before leaving the shores of the Waiohine. Ahead of them, the red shed was getting bigger and bigger. They wondered what was inside. The final push was the hardest, the steepest of the hillside, calling on all their young resources until at last they reached the top. Collapsing in the grass, they lay sprawled out for a minute or two, and then, raising themselves, sat and marvelled at the view below. The mighty wider upper valley was spread out before them. Greytown, as clear as day, the towns of Featherston and Carterton in the distance, and the great expanses of farmland for miles. It was Hillary and Tenzing all over again. The little red shed was just that, a little red farm shed with nothing inside. But the riddle had been solved, and the boys were well satisfied with what they had achieved. Now for the downward journey. Slipping and sliding their way down, the boys lost height at a rate of knots. They would be back on the flat in no time. A few grass stains on the seat of their shorts, but so what? Then out of nowhere, a flock of turkeys appeared, close to the bottom of the hill. Turkeys? They must be wild ones. Highly unlikely, but the boys were convinced. We should catch one and take it home. For the next half hour the boys stalked, scared up and attempted to catch the elusive turkeys, 
chasing them fruitlessly about the paddock as the birds kicked up a merry howl, just as well there wasn't a farmer in sight. Finally, when just about to give up the chase, the boys caught a break. A turkey made the mistake of heading into a patch of scrub, probably as exhausted as his pursuers. It got tangled up just long enough for Evan to thrust forward and grab it. But what do we do? Kill it here or take it home and do it? he asked. Both boys looked at their catch. The turkey's big eyes looked back, its head wobbling about on its scrawny neck. The thought of killing it, here or at home, was rapidly losing its appeal. What say it isn't a wild turkey? the boy volunteered. It belongs to someone. Maybe we should let it go, Evan answered. Brilliant. A way out for both of them. All those hard yards chasing and catching the turkey had been in vain. But there was a sense of relief when the poor miserable bird was released scurrying off to join the flock. The boys were sure it looked back and winked. Where have you been? Mum asked. Just down at the creek with our boats. You are far too late for lunch. But there is some left for you. Wasn't she great? All the fun of the day and a meal at its end. That night, just on dusk, the boy and Evan joined Mum and Dad and Elaine in a huddle round the recently acquired mental radio that sat perched on a triangular wooden shelf in the kitchen. The older two, Gary and Pamela, were elsewhere, doing whatever older children did. Pamela was probably reading in her room, and Gary fiddling about with the old wind-up gramophone he had got from somewhere. It was time for Life with Dexter, the weekly half-hour radio comedy that, like the Melbourne Cup, stopped two nations. Dexter and Jesse Dutton, their two children Ashley and Janine and Clara and Kimberly, KG, Wilmot, were going camping in the North Lakes. It would be a disaster, of course, as the two Aussie families battled a zoo of insects, ants and butter and jam and verbally spread with each other. I'm going to read that again, that didn't sound right. It would be a disaster, of course, as the two Aussie families battled a zoo full of insects, ants. Ah, there's a comma there. <laughs> ants in the butter and jam and verbally sparred with each other. Clara Wilmot's acid tongue, Dexter's attempts to win favour with his boss KG and the never-ending battle of the sexes brought gales of laughter. The day the laughter would stop for the boy as thousands of others throughout the land was just around the corner, when the school bell would ring, summoning them to class for the start of another school year. Right, that's the end of our chapter. I'm now going to play you a piece of music. I've played one piece from this band before. The piece of music and the title and everything was relevant to the story. This one, not as much, but it is a very cool band. Not enough people know about them, so we're going to do our best to make sure they do. This is another piece of music from the New Zealand band Shepherd's Rain. This one is now Cold Summer's Night. I'm sitting here alone Watching the days go by Nothing feels like home With no one to see me cry But all of Nothing could hold me down Now I'm on my knees Hear me 
hoping to hear a sound. But all alone, I reached out. I didn't know. I thought I was okay But I'm so far away I drank myself to sleep Every night To wash all this pain away I've said it before, I'll say it again, best New Zealand hard rock slash heavy metal band ever. Or best band ever. Mm. Probably. Okay, next chapter, this one's a little bit longer. Hopefully I've still got a voice by the end of it. Chapter 13, End of the Golden Weather. Like it or lump it, and a return to school was always going to happen. And the boy, no, let's do that again. Like it or lump it, a return to school was always going to happen, and the boy had to suck it up and go. This year he would be in Standard 4. He didn't know it yet, but it would be a watershed year for him. He could trace his schoolyard experiences way back to the first day he had signed in as a primer in the school. The shock of that day had knocked his socks off. Five years of sheltering under the umbrella of mum and dad at home had come to a sudden stop. Gone were his days of sitting in the shade of an old apple tree as Dad pruned gooseberries, tipping from the bottle of orange cordial Mum had made up for him from concentrate for her thirsty husband, which was largely siphoned off by her son. Gone were the days of helping Dad steer the heavy rotary hoe, cultivating between rows of raspberries and currants, or playing around at the base of the giant macrocarpa tree, easily the biggest in town. A nesting season dozens that's interesting. A nesting season dozens, if not hundreds of birds, built their nest in it, safe from human disturbance. The trunk reached for the sky before its branching before branching out into a series of massive bows, impossible to climb. Gone were the days of playing in Teddy's fort, made from pine branches hacked off several gnarled old trees and covered with grass and straw. The fort was stocked with old pots and pans and the prized brown cake tin he had relentlessly nagged his mother for until she capitulated. This, my boy, was a jolt into reality, 
a resetting of life's watch. Elaine had been tasked with taking the boy to school on that day, accompanying him to the infant room to come eye to eye with, Mrs. with Miss Margaret Bowles, his teacher. A group of children were sitting on the mat in the high ceiling classroom. They looked subdued and were holding their hands on their heads, all of them. That, the boy thought, was weird. Miss Rolls moved towards him. She cut a formidable figure. To the boy, she looked at least middle-aged. A huge overestimation, in fact. Her hair was dragged back into a bun. Her clothes were sensible. School mom type. Her gaze was direct and frightening. Her weak smile did little to soften the boy's initial diagnosis. She was going to be a worthy opponent. Elaine bid her little brother farewell and abandoned him to the clutches of this woman, who soon ordered him to join the timid bunch on the mat, his classmates. The morning was a blur. Miss Rolls issued the children with crayons and paper and barked orders to quieten down. When things got too rowdy, she clamped down completely, ordering children to lie flat on the mat, not to utter a sound, even pretend to be asleep. This was foreign stuff to the boy. This was hell. The bell rang for morning break. He shuffled out into the schoolyard under the curious gaze of other children, wondering who the new boy on the block was. Fighting his instinct to bolt for home, an idea stimmied in part by the presence of protector Elaine, he reluctantly returned to class. Lunchtime came. Elaine arrived to take him home for lunch which the farmer children and many others did daily. How did school go? Mum asked. I hate it. I hate that woman who tells us what to do. I'm not going back this afternoon. Sorry, but you are. War had been declared. It was to last many months. Each school morning for all that time that the boy revolted against authority. On the way to school, he would escape the clutches of Elaine and run, but the fleet-footed girl would catch him and jostle him along until they reached the school grounds. She had a job to do, the boy knew that, but he wished she would move off long enough for him to escape and head for the hills. He would go through the motions of learning his ABCs, fiddling away with chalk and crayons and singing silly little songs. This was a far cry from his idyllic home life, and now squeezed up to two days a week. Nope, let's do that again. This was a far cry from his idyllic life at home, now squeezed up to two days a week, Saturday and Sunday. Slowly the realisation there were some OK kids among the classmates dawned on the boy. This helped to temper his furious resistance to a more passive style and non-compliance, but it didn't disappear entirely until much later. The boy was soon to come under the wing of a couple of older teachers, who made little impression on him until he joined the class of Miss Jean Inez. Miss Inez was kinder and on the pff, Miss Inez was kinder on the eye of those matronly types who went before, all kind and kinder all round. She led the singing of good songs, like Bonnie Bobby Shafto, and read stories aloud, good, interesting stories. Things were looking up, but even kindly Miss Inez had occasionally to enforce the rules when pleas to reason failed, and with the aid of the standard issue leather strap. She had never had to strap the boy, and really anyone else, but once had to call out, we manihira, one of the many Papawai kids in the school who had committed a minor transgression. Little did she know that what was to follow would enter into the annals of school history to be talked about, to be talked amongst, no I did say that right first time, to be talked about among the kids for years to come. Ordering Wee to put out his hand, Miss Inez attempted to strap it. While a young Wee dropped his hand down, she missed. The kids burst out laughing. Warning we with a dire threat not to do it again. Miss Inez brought the strap down again. We dropped his hand. She missed. The kids laughed even louder. Miss Inez had no option now. She had to win this war of wills. Ordering we to put his out his hand again, she changed tactics, lowering her aim and propelling the strap to his legs. But we was up to the challenge. He jumped and the strap soared under his legs. 
she had missed, and the kids broke up with laughter. Defeated, Miss Inez ordered class hero wee back to his seat. No point in entertaining the children further. By the time he had cleared the infant classes and entered Standard 1, the worst was over for the boy. Maury Wimp, a.k.a. Herr von Wimp, a firm but fair teacher, was in charge. He drove one of the school buses and owned a poultry farm at Moroa, a second string to his financial bow. One morning, as the lesson of the day got underway, he turned his back on the kids to write on the blackboard. What was that splattered all over the seat of his grey flannel trousers? Chok poo? It was. Arriving home after school, Mr Wimp always parked the school bus in his shed. An errant hen had obviously settled down for the night on the driver's seat, its calling card transferred to the teacher's trousers. The children giggled, but said nothing. They wondered how Mr Wimp had got this far, how other teachers had not noticed his dilemma when he went into the staff room there before school for his morning coffee. Maybe he had been running late and missed out on coffee today. With repeated giggling each time he turned his back to the class, Mr Wimp demanded an explanation. One brave soul, not the boy, told him. The embarrassed teacher took it in good spirit but soon disappeared from the room, having set the kids' work that would take a while to complete. He returned wearing a fresh pair of pants. Perhaps an urgent call had gone out to his wife to deliver them to the school. Two years with Mr Wimp passed with little earth-shattering change. The boys' school reports showed he was average in most subjects, his lack of real interest revealed in comments like, could try harder. Trying hard and never arrived with a move to standard three either. The class was at first. Mm, oh, the class was at first looked after by a couple of relief teachers until a young teacher, Mr. Duncan, arrived to take over. To say he struggled to handle a class full of country kids is being kind to him. It was bedlam. The boys and many of the girls ran riot and invented a disgusting game that showered them in anything but glory. Chewing paper until it became a wet mush, kids flicked the gooey lumps at the ceiling using rulers. The blobs stuck to the high ceiling, remaining there for days, weeks, sometimes months before the spittle dried out. Then the disgusting lumps dislodged landing on the floor or the desks of the culprits below. Mr Duncan did have one advantage though. When the going got too tough, or the din from the classroom too loud and in oh, sorry uh, din from the classroom too loud, in would march headmaster Bart Kelly to straighten things out. Mr Kelly ran the school with an iron fist, instilling genuine fear in the children. He had taken over from the much more mild mannered Jeff Foote who had been headmaster from 1950, who, in turn, had taken on the role when Mr Nightingale stood down after a five-year stint and headed off to a school at Kati Kati. Flinging open the classroom door, Mr Kelly would bellow quiet, while bringing from his pocket his lethal weapon, a, lethal, a leather strap he, for some perverse reason, had named Brown Sands. He would slam Brown Sands down on the desk, issuing dire threats of what would happen to any wayward kid who challenged his authority in the slightest way. It worked. Well, for the time being, anyway. The boy was to get a glimpse of the fearful headmaster in a different light, suggesting his bark may have been worse than his bite. One afternoon, when school had finished, the boy stayed back to play marbles. Timmy Smithson and the boy were engrossed in a game of rounds, and after an especially bad shot, the boy uttered the words, Bloody hell. He was unaware Mr Kelly was on after-school playground duty and was standing right behind him. What did you say, boy? Get into my office and stand outside the door until I come to deal with you. Shaking like a cat in a wet sack, the boy did as he was told, knowing the sky was about to fall in. He stood to get six of the best. 
the boy waited and waited and waited. No, Mr. Kelly, had he forgotten? Had he gone home? Just as he was about to sneak off, Mr. Kelly appeared from the staff room and began heading back down the corridor. He looked up and with obvious surprise saw the boy still standing there. For a moment he struggled to remember why he had ordered the boy to his office, but recollected the terrible crime of using foul language. What followed was a farce, a lesson in intimidation. Mr. Kelly dressed the boy down as he sought to find brown sands. Slowly he opened the first of his desk drawers. Not there. Draw two. Not there either. It must be in this one. No, not there or in drawer four or five. Only one drawer left. Slowly Mr. Kelly opened, drawed open the... F no, we'll do that again. Slowly Mr. Kelly drew open the final drawer as the boy's heart pounded. Was it there all the time and Mr. Kelly knew it? Was the dreaded headmaster playing a cruel game? Pulling the last drawer half open, Mr. Kelly peered inside. A pause, then. It's not there either. Now get cracking and head off for home. The boy could scarcely believe his luck. Some months later, while playing out in the long grass behind the school, the boy found a flash-looking wristwatch on top of a tree stump. Workmen had been clearing up scrubby trees there not long before. The watch with its gold-plated metal strap had probably belonged to one of them. It was a beauty, with four encrusted ruby glass dots at twelve, three, six, and nine. The boy could have just picked it up, but he didn't. He did the honest thing and took it to the headmaster's office, handing it in. Mr. Kelly said he would take it to the police to find the owner, and that, it seemed, would be the end of the story. Two months later, Mr. Kelly bailed the boy up in the, class, in the playground. Come to my office and get the watch. The police had no luck finding the owner, so it's yours. You found it. The reign of Mr. Kelly gave way to a happy era of headmaster Cliff Crossman, a short, thick-set rugby lover and much loved by staff and pupils alike. He had no need for a brown sands. In his heyday as a King Country rugby player, Cliff Crossman had come close to All Black selection. At school, he helped out with coaching and driving young players to their Saturday rugby games and was the inspiration behind the boys' first ever try in a Greytown versus Gladstone clash at the Gladstone school grounds. With the match locked up at nil all well into the second half, the Greytown kids were toiling away when the, boy, when the ball popped up at the boys' feet. Kick it, was the bellied instruction from the headmaster, Crossman, running from the sideline. Then kick it again, and another kick it. The boy bounced over the goal line where the boy, just inches ahead of a Gladstone defender, fell on it. Nope, I'll do that again because that sounded weird. The ball bounced over the goal line where the boy, just inches ahead of a Gladstone defender, fell on it with great delight, Mr. Crossman. A 3-0 win. The boy could not wait to get home. He burst into the kitchen. I scored a try. It had been an eventful day, one to paste in the memory alongside an afternoon on the Slater farm on the Hupenui Road. <coughs> that day the boy had teamed up with his mate, Chris Slater, having biked to the farm just after lunch. The two boys mucked about, looking for evidence of ancient Māori hangi, hangi pits, and generally musing themselves until mid-afternoon. Then they hit the idea of pilfering what they thought was sweet corn from a crop on the farm with the idea of selling it cob by cob as they biked back to the boys' home. They ferreted out a couple of sugar bags from a shed and sneaked into a paddock where they stripped off 56 cobs without being seen by anyone. The two bulging bags delicately balanced on the bars of their bikes and they set off in towards town, not pulling up until they reached East Street where they stopped to sample their ill-gotten gains. It was not what they had expected. In fact, it was foul. Cows would have loved it, but the boys certainly didn't, and that created a problem. We can't sell this, Chris said. So what do we do with it, the boy asked. I don't know. I can't take it back home, Chris replied. 
After some contemplation, they hit on a solution. They couldn't sell it, but they could give it away, even if people didn't want it. So for the next half hour, they cycled around town, dipping into the bag and tossing a single cob on the front lawn, even popping a few into mailboxes at houses from which they could not be seen. Everything went to plan until they got into West Street. The boy tossed a cob onto a lawn, only to be startled by a voice which seemed to spring from nowhere. Mick Buckley had been sitting unseen by either the boy or Chris just inside the front fence. What did you boys throw into my place? He boomed in his best Irish accent. Chris and the boy almost collided with fright before Chris regained his composure. Have it for breakfast, old man, he said, and the two trod down hard on their bike pedals. Corn cob sales had proved to be not-for-profit enterprise. The boy's attitude to school was turning a corner helped along by his love of playing rugby and cricket, and, strangely, he started to make real headway with his schooling at the time, when it seemed most unlikely. Assistant Headmaster Don McNabb was the Standard 4 teacher with a reputation of not being everyone's cup of tea. More correctly, coffee, as he was addicted to it, drinking as many as 10 cups a day while at school. Mr McNabb was a hard taskmaster with a personality that did not appeal to many children or staff, but the boy, although always weary of the man, thrived under his tutelage. Before becoming a teacher, Mr McNabb had been involved in meteorology and had an undying interest in weather and cloud formations. His parents lived directly across from the school in a little cottage later to become the home of the Dunn family. But he was married to Pamela and lived in a wooden villa on the corner of Main Street and Jellicoe Street. Soon the boy knew how to classify and recognise cloud formations and weather patterns, and his natural interest in these probably gave him the edge with a teacher who didn't hand out many accolades. The boy was making steady progress academically, and his half yearly report astounded him, and certainly his mum and dad. Almost a clean sweep of straight A's. Mr McNabb was nicknamed Nobs. He had a strange sense of humour which only surfaced occasionally, his moods usually morose, harbouring the ability to fly into a rage at the drop of a hat. A rage was foreshadowed by his habit of sucking in his breath through coffee-stained teeth, his voice rising several octaves as he struggled to contain his anger, usually over there being too much noise in the classroom. Then, Nobbs was likely to resort to any manner of tactics, including firing sticks of chalk or a blackboard duster at the kids, his voice re reaching fever pitch. On really bad days, he would storm into the class, handing his leather strap to the nearest child with instructions to pass it on. That kick-started a mad scramble to offload the strap with any prospect of learning from lessons put on hold. The threat was that when the school bell rang for the morning break, any boy holding the strap would be strapped. Any girl given lines. It was a pointless exercise, a mind game designed to frighten children into towing the line. The threatened punishments were never carried out. At other times, Mr McNabb showed unexpected compassion. He was a clever man, not only academically, but with his hands. He had a passion for working with wood, and at his home made a loom for weaving. But he hated gardening. Part of the school's curriculum was for boys to learn how to prepare a garden and grow vegetables. Several small garden plots along the senior school block were used, with boys divided into teams, each assigned a garden. Mr McNabb would wait until work started, then disappear, either back into the classroom, or more often, to the staff room to make himself yet another cup of coffee. One scorching summer afternoon, the boy, who was captain of a gardening team, called his crew to order to down tools. The boys retreated to a shady side of the woodwork room nearby, lounging on the grass, when suddenly round the side of the building loomed Mr McNabb. Wait for it. What's going on here, he hissed, his face distorted with rage. The boy had to think fast, and did. It's far too hot for gardening, sir. I told my boys to knock off. Mr McNabb glared at the boy. Then, 
with the fierce wider up a sun beating down on him, went quiet. You are the only boy with any sense, he said, before calling out for all the boys to stop work and to clean off their shovels and spades and return them to the tool shed. In the winter, Mr McNabb allowed the boy an afternoon off school to see the touring Fijian rugby team play wider up in Masterton. It was his first time seeing a rugby game of greater input than club rugby. His love of rugby had deepened immensely a winter earlier when he had sat with Dad transfixed as radio broadcaster Winston McCarthy called out the action in the All Blacks tests against the touring Springboks. Never had he felt such excitement. Mum was threatened with a face for the fate worse than death if she so much as made a sound, let alone speak. The All Blacks had somewhat surprisingly won that first test at Carisbrook in Dunedin, as their last outing had been against Australia, a team not considered to be as big a threat as South Africa, and yet they had been beaten. The Springboks avenged themselves in the second test at the Ooh, let's try that again. Second test at Athletic Park in Wellington, but again lost to the All Blacks in the third, held at Lancaster Park in Christchurch. To lift the rubber and win the series, the All Blacks could not concede defeat or settle for a draw in the final test at Eden Park in Auckland. The boy and his father were on the edge of their seats. It was a nail-biter, a brutal contest. <clears throat> Star All Blacks winger Ron Jarden suffered an injured arm and had to drop back to become a lame duck, extra fullback. There were no replacements. Centre Pat Walsh went to the wing and flanker Bill Clark peeled off. The forward pack, nope, that's sounding weird with all the pauses in there. Centre Pat Walsh went to the wing and flanker Bill Clark peeled off the forward pack to join the back line. Later in the game, Locke Tiny White was subject to a brutal assault and had to leave the field, leaving the All Blacks with a six-man scrum. Things looked grim until massive number eight, Peter Jones, who could sprint like a winger despite his size, careered away for another try under the posts, and Don Clark converted, sealing the game for the All Blacks. There was untold jubilation throughout the land. At the gate to the Fiji versus Wider Upper game, the boy bought a souvenir badge to pin on his jersey and a programme. He fluked a spot to sit right at the very front on the grass, almost nudging the sideline. Oh, excuse me. It is Monday. From that low vantage point, he could see the thundering thighs of the huge Fiji and seemingly bearing down on him. The boy felt sorry for the wider upper players who had to confront these charging steamrollers and proud of any one of them that managed to bring one down. When the final whistle blew, the Fijians had outmuscled wider upper to win 27 to 8. School broke up for the summer holidays. Children filed out of the school grounds, not giving a single thought to what the next school year would bring, except there was an unsettling rumour doing the rounds. Word was being put out that Mr McNabb would be following his class, becoming the Standard 5 teacher. Crestfallen children prayed that would not be. Let some other, let some other class take the heat. Let them learn how to survive in the McNabb climate. Their prayers were answered. Mr McNabb stayed put and the boy and his peers discovered their teacher for the coming year was an altogether different kettle of fish. An attractive young woman, barely in her twenties, resplendent in a yellow skirt and smiling, was sitting behind her desk at the front of the class. Her name, they were told, was Mary Singleton. It turned out Miss Singleton was new to teaching, and was one of Aggie Parker's boarders, although she didn't warm to Aggie, and later moved out to board with Margaret York in Kurutafiri Street. Miss Singleton quickly won the hearts of the children. She selected wonderful storybooks to read to them in serial fashion, rewarding a good morning's work with an extended afternoon recital. She organised a class quiz. She brought social studies lessons to life. She earned respect. The boy was as happy as a pig in mud. By this time he had developed a passion for politics, listening to Parliament on the radio, reading up 
on the great statesmen of the last century, preparing make-believe budgets, appointing cabinet. One morning Miss Singleton was to discover just how well versed in politics the boy was. A quiz question, which party first became government in New Zealand in 1935, she asked. For the boy it was like falling off a log. He shot up his hand, Labour, and then went on to name every cabinet minister appointed 23 years earlier by the then Prime Minister Mickey Savage and their portfolios. Mrs Singleton did not interrupt him, and when he was done she said, I'm speechless. She couldn't have challenged the accuracy anyway, she simply didn't know. Capping off a great year for the boy was a class trip to Wellington, which included a visit to Parliament. There to greet them was wider upper MP Bertie Cooksley, and the boy was given the honour of leading the class into the debating chamber. It was like winning the national lottery. Things were moving fast for the boy now. 1959 would be his last at primary school. The sun was starting to set on his childhood. His three older siblings had long since departed, and Evan had cleared the infant classes. A few years earlier, Evan's first day at school was one to never be forgotten. He too had been put under the care of the formidable Miss Rolls, and this time it was the boy's duty to take his younger brother to meet his teacher. Miss Rolls made the fatal mistake of scooping blonde-haired Evan up, presumably to give him a hug. His response was to deliver a stinging right hook to the side of her face. You naughty boy, she hollered. Go and stand in the sand pit. Evan had done as he was told. He stood there looking into the sand, his back to the rest of the class, unmoving right through until the morning break. The boy's last year at Greytown School was the best. With his faith in teachers restored by Mary Singleton, the boy entered the class of the hugely popular teacher, Gordon Patterson. The young teacher destined to become school principal had what it took to make kids thrive in class and in sport, a wonderful mixture of firmness, fun and frivolity. Frivolity? Frivolity? Frivolity. Check my thesaurus on that one. There was never a dull moment. Mr. Patterson organised impromptu speeches. He led the singing of Frere Jacques. He jumped aboard Stan Slater's flat debt truck, joining a bottle drive to raise money for a class trip to Christchurch. He even married the infant mistress, Cora Johnson. The class was divided into houses. Rangatira, green. Koromiko, red, Monowai, gold, and Hinemoa, blue. Fierce competition for points was kept going at a furious pace all year. A sports lover, Mr. Patterson took the rugby team under his wing, with training held after school. One late autumn afternoon, the boy and his teammates were ready and waiting, decked out in their colours of red, yellow, and black, but there was no sign of the coach. Round and round the boys jogged in a circle, passing the leather rugby ball back and forward. It went on for five, seven, ten minutes. No coach. The boy was getting a bit pissed off. Where the hell's Patterson, he blurted out. I'm right behind you, bruiser. As teammates who had noticed the arrival of the coach cringed, the boy turned slowly around, relieved to see a huge smile on Mr. Patterson's face. There would be no retribution for his cheekiness. His teacher had adopted the occasional nickname Bruiser for the boy. Why was a bit of a mystery as the boy was not big and played in midfield. He was not going to have a bar of battling away in the forwards, certainly not after seeing the cauliflower ears that grew on the sides of older rugby players' heads. Perhaps Mr Patterson had known the boy's devotion to his English bull terrier Barney, whose kennel name was Spitfire Bruiser. Well, maybe. The promise of a class trip to Christchurch set in motion a flurry of fundraising. Robert Yule, son of caterer and mayor Fred Yule Sr., cooked saveloys, wrapped them in buttered bread and sold them from the veranda of an open-air classroom at lunch breaks. John Clemo, son of Methodist church minister, made a pushcart and took young children on rides around the block, for a fee of course. Pine cones were bagged and sold. Finally the day came. 
HMS Rangatira left Wellington on October 13, carrying a gaggle of excited children and on an overnight sailing to the big smoke in the southern capital. The boy was billeted into a cabin for three, his mates for the hours of the darkness being... Let's make sure we get this word right here. Inimitable Chris Slater and Richard Turai, as he hatched a mischievous plan. There were four berths. Richard claimed the top bunk on the port side, above a porthole looking out to an outside deck. Chris leapt to the starboard top bunk. They thought they had beaten the boy to the punch, but he settled in without a complaint, taking the bunk below Richard and biding his time. As talk petered out, Chris and Richard sought sleep. The boy waited until he heard the gentle sounds of slumber coming from them both. Taking the bottom of the curtain covering the porthole, he slowly pulled it open, allowing direct light from the outside deck's lights, deck lights, deck lights, deck light, deck light. oh my god. Slowly pulled it open, allowing light from the outside deck's lights to flood directly onto Chris's face. Chris stirred and mumbled and then settled again. After half a minute, the boy did the same again. Again, Chris awoke and settled, but by this time, the third rays of lights hit his from the face and he exploded. Stop that, Turoi, he shouted. Richard woke with a start. Stop what? You know what I mean. The boy was, of course, obviously sound asleep by then giggling into his pillow, as the two became more and more agitated with each curtain opening, stopping only when fisticuffs seemed likely. Docking in the South Island, the kids were taken to the White Hart Hotel. The next morning, straight after breakfast, were off to Harewood Airport, where they were shown over the American Deep Freeze aircraft, a Globemaster. They visited Christchurch Cathedral, clambering up the steep stone steps to the top, and they went on a tour of Kashmir Hills. For the boy, the trip was a highlight of the year. Well, almost. That really came at the tail end of the year. As school wound down, class thoughts turned to who would be named Ducks, and who would take the other major prizes. To the boy it seemed obvious the studious Ingrid Ward would be Ducks, but he fancied his chances for best all-round boy. After all, he had been class captain, woodwork captain, gardening captain, played rugby and cricket, won the open sprint at the school swimming sports, and was the top boy academically. He had to admit his chances had improved when his main rival and good friend Francis Tucker left school at the end of term two, shifting to Carterton with his family. It would have been touch and go had Francis still been in the class. Now only John Maxwell had an outside chance of beating him. With just a few days to go before the end of year prize giving, the boy blundered. It was early on Saturday evening, no it wasn't, it was early on Saturday afternoon, when he and a friend were walking to the Bluebird for ice creams, when they saw fresh-faced young teacher Don Ogier arrive at the shop on his bicycle. A black Labrador dog trotting towards him on the footpath took exception to seeing the teacher pulling up outside the shop and began to growl and snarl. The boy and his mate stopped to watch as the teacher circled the growling animal, keeping a weary eye on the canine that continued to bark and snarl as Mr Ogier moved backwards into the safety of the shop. Monday morning came. The boy spied Mr Ogier in the school ground and couldn't resist a jibe. It's a pity that dog didn't eat you yesterday. It was a huge error of judgment. Mr Ogier stopped in his tracks, taking a stern look at the cheeky brat who had mouthed those words. Get to my classroom. I'm going to see your teacher and get his permission to strap you. Outside Mr Ogier's classroom, the boy waited. The punishment didn't particularly worry him. He had been told Mr Ogier in his first year at school wasn't a big hitter. Out from the staff room came two teachers side by side. They reached where the boy was standing, looked suitably same to her. They reached where the boy was standing, looking suitably shamefaced. Mr. Patterson asked him what he had said to Mr. Ogier, and was told. And here I was going to name you best all round boy, Mr. Patterson said. You may strap him. 
The boy's heart sank, but before leaving his pupil to his fate, Mr. Patterson looked at the boy's face. Look, fighting back a grin, he winked and walked off. That gave the boy new hope. He hardly felt any of the four blows that followed. Come the morning of prize-giving held in the town hall, so as many parents as possible could be there, the kids milled around in nervous excitement. The boy's mum was there. He saw her and gave her a wave, and she beamed. Ingrid was named Ducks. Janice Tucker, all-round girl. Leslie Stringfellow, best sports person. Malem Nicholas got English prize. The tension was unbearable. Then the announcement came. The boy, Don Farmer, was awarded the Co Cup as the school's best all-round boy. As he held up the trophy aloft, he caught his mother's eye. The boy who had once been dragged to school on his bum, who had stumbled along without trying until the most unlikely teacher had lit a fuse that changed all of that, had come out on top. Little did he realise that day was to be one of his very last as the boy. Soon as he would know, or soon he would be known as Don Farmer, or Buck, a nickname that he inherited from older brother Gary, and which would carry through to Evan also. That day the boy had begun to emerge from the warm comforting cocoon of childhood to step out into a quite different world, fondly cradling his memory of what older people had often told him would be the best years of his life. Really was quite a long chapter. Yes, it definitely was. It's actually 9.56 now. I normally talk for half an hour. It's been almost an hour. But that's okay. We've finished those ones. We've got... Um, there's a few more chapters to go. It's getting towards the end of the book. The next chapters are all quite small. Uh, so, yes, I'll catch up with you Monday. After that, um, it's obviously the, the Christmas break. I will probably not be coming in here. And it'll be, I think it's the 6th or the 8th, whatever the, the Monday is around that time period is when we'll do the next one. So we'll do one more show this year and then we'll catch up with the next year, but I'll touch on that next week. So have a fantastic week and we will catch up with you.